Now, back one day in 1963, a young girl received a note from her father. It read, as the oldest of the next generation, you have a particular responsibility. Be kind to others and work for your country. Love, Daddy. That is what Robert Kennedy wrote to 12-year-old Kathleen two days after her uncle, President John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. Kathleen Kennedy Townsend took her father's words to heart and has emerged as one of the most promising standard bearers of her extraordinarily public-minded family. And we are thrilled to have her here today to deliver the keynote speech. Like many in the Kennedy clan, Kathleen grew up with family football, politics, and received her undergraduate degree from Harvard. She was only 16 when her father was killed, and she spent her bravement teaching Native American children in Arizona, something her father undoubtedly would have approved. She married Professor David Townsend, and together they have produced four lovely daughters, two of whom are here today. Kate, as your mother calls you, Kath, as your contemporaries, and Carrie, we welcome you, and thank you for being a part of today. Kathleen went on to become a lawyer, and she received her law degree from University of New Mexico School of Law. At first, her involvement in politics consisted mainly of volunteering for her Uncle Teddy's campaigns and stumping for local and congressional candidates. But in 1984, two years after the family moved to her husband's home state of Maryland, she decided to run for a congressional seat. The district was strongly Republican, but Kathleen told her husband, someone has to run, and this is where my kids are gonna grow up. She lost, but the loss taught her a great deal. The next few years, she buckled down, she honed her public speaking and her campaigning skills, and just, just like her father, Kathleen is a learner, and learned she did. When gubernatorial candidate Paris Glendening chose her to be his running mate in 1994, experts doubted she would help the ticket, and she proved them wrong. Her name recognition, her political skills, and her own personal message helped deliver a candidacy and an election. She became the only Kennedy woman to hold office at that point. In public service, Kathleen has been a lifelong advocate for women, children, and the underserved. Her career has focused on creating public and private partnerships to some of the most intractable problems facing America today. As the first woman lieutenant governor of Maryland, she focused much of her attention on fighting crime and boosting economic development recognizing that strong, healthy communities grow from strong, healthy families, she redesigned Maryland's children and family services to enable local communities to work together to meet the specific needs of families. She co-chaired the Family Violence Council that strengthened laws and created programs to protect victims of domestic violence and to break the cycle of abuse. Her leadership led to better health care for families. Now, over 95,000 of the state's neediest children have access to health insurance, and over 60,000 senior citizens have access to affordable prescription drugs. Prior to her service as Lieutenant Governor, she was Deputy Assistant Journey, Attorney General of the United States, and in that role, she led to the the planning to put 100,000 police officers into the community. She ignited the Police Corps, a program to give college scholarships to young people who pledged to work as police officers for four years after graduating. And prior to her service at the Department of Justice, she spent seven years as the founder and director of the Maryland Student Service Alliance. It was in that role that she led the fight to make Maryland the first state in the nation to require high school students to perform community service. Kathleen has taught foreign policy at the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. 
She has published articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Washington Monthly. And in the mid-80s, she, with others, founded the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award that honors individuals who, whose courageous activism is at the heart of the human rights movement and is the spirit of Robert F. Kennedy's vision of social justice. Her staunch support of women and their rights has been endemic through her, throughout her career. She is adamant about encouraging women to run for political office. She led by example by running for governor for the state of Maryland in 2002. And when asked what it would take to get a woman elected, a theme we've heard today, her reply was, get women elected governors so that people are accustomed to seeing women in executive positions. That is what the Margaret Brent Awards are about, getting us accustomed to seeing extraordinary women who have broken through barriers and who are giving back to women, to their communities, and to the generations current and future. Kathleen Kennedy Townsend is a shining example of what it means to be such a woman. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's, very, it's a wonderful uh, honor to be here with you and with these extraordinary women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be here. I'm honored to be with these, each of you who have won the Margaret Brent Award. Um, your, your stories are quite extraordinary. I remember my first time I went to an ABA convention, I think it was about 1965, with my father. And uh, there weren't a lot of women on the podium. <laughs> and it's nice to see the change over the years. Um, I, uh, I'm really thrilled to be at the ABA. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, Ted Sorensen is going to speak tomorrow about the pro bono practice and increasing the renaissance for uh, service that the ABA has always been known for. I want to thank Mike for doing that. Um, I, I have to tell you that. Ted Sorensen, you know, as some of you may know, you're staying at the Hilton, you might have seen my uncle John Kennedy's picture there uh, when he spoke to the mayors here in 1963. And Ted Sorensen, who will speak tomorrow, told me that he had come with him at that time to help uh, draft what I think was my uncle's best speech, probably after the inaugural speech, on the non at American University, you'd like to know, about the non nuclear nonproliferation treaty. Um, so it was nice to see that. But what was interesting about talking to Mike about pro bono, I said, I'm glad you're promoting pro bono. That's critical. But more important at this time in our country's history is to defend the rule of law. And I want to thank Mike and the ABA for standing up for the rule of law. I don't think there's any more important time. I thought your statements on the presidential signing statements were critical. And there's so much more that the ABA has to say about what's going on in our country. And let me tell you, more than anything else you can do, that is critical. Good luck, Mike, and good luck to the ABA. Good luck to our country. Um, I'm glad you looked into the Margaret Brent Award. Margaret Brent, as some of you may know, or most of you may know, has come from Maryland. So I've gone to many, many Margaret Brent celebrations, none is quite as stellar as this, but, but many of them. And what I love about Margaret Brand is obviously she was a lawyer, she was a Catholic, uh, <laughs> one of 14 kids. Um, <laughs> she defended uh, you know, the Catholics in Maryland, and not, uh, she also was a politician, and she demanded not just one vote, but two. None of you know that, but if you're in Maryland, you'd realize. She thought uh, she deserved two because she deserved one because she was representing her client, and then she deserved one for herself. <laughs> Unfortunately, she didn't get those two votes. Um, so she, it's a, she's a wonderful role model in the sense of guts and courage and persistence. But she's not a wonderful role model in the sense of building a community that keeps going. Because it took hundreds of years after Margaret Bent made her demand for the two votes and 
was fighting for Lord Baltimore, that more women could become attorneys. And that's why this is such an important uh, day and effort on the par part of the ABA, to not support just single women, although each of these are single, but how you build a movement of women who will help other women and women who will bring the profession so that more than 13% are partners in law firms, so that we have women governors, so that we have women represented, really represented at all levels. And that takes really, I believe, a change of culture and talking to one another and helping one another. And I say this because it's really based on my own experience. Um, as some of you know, <laughs> after that long pictures and stories that Pam told me, I come from a political family. <laughs> I even come from a family that has produced lawyers. Um, but when I was growing up, it never occurred to me that I would be involved in politics or law. That's what, what got, that's what guys did. And actually, it was really kind of hard to figure out what I should do, because having 11 children also was a little intimidating. <laughs> so the question was, how did it come to be that we could all dream bigger dreams? And I've always thanked the women's movement for opening my eyes. Now, it is absolutely clear that I learned many values from my family. Um, the value of service, the value of giving, the value of, of trying to make a difference. I mean, when I was sitting around our dining room table, you know, my parents said each of us had to recite a current event, and it was very important what you sat at our table. If you sat next to my mother, you just had to read the front page. But as you went around the table, you really had to know what was going on. <laughs> and my mother thought that was such a good idea. Actually, my father said we not only quizzed on current events, we were also quizzed on history. Um, and every Sunday, we had to either recite a poem or do a report on a famous person in history. It's a great childhood. <laughs> I know. I, I used to write my grandmother letters, you know, because my mother thought that was a good idea. She'd return them redlined, correcting our grammar, <laughs> our spelling, and our diction. <laughs> Such a warm family. <laughs> but, but my mother thought this idea of current events was good. Whenever she drove the carpool, she insisted that everybody in the carpool know what was going on. Say, oh no, Mrs. Kennedy is driving. What happened today? <laughs> and it wasn't just knowing current events. We actually had to participate. So that when my other four and five-year-olds were, you know, t being taken by their mother to the playground to swing on the swings and go play in the um, and on the slide, uh, my mother uh, took me to the Senate Racket Committee hearings. And my first words were, I refuse to answer that. <laughs> you think it's funny. <laughs> you live that life. <laughs> oh, but there, and obviously, we, I did learn um, the importance of the law. And when my father was the attorney general, it was at the time of the civil rights movement, um, where there was the integration of the, you know, the University of Mississippi and the University of Alabama and the protection of the freedom fighters, freedom riders. Um, I remember also when my father was uh, in the Senate, he had gone down uh, to Mississippi to hold the first hunger hearings. You may remember them in the Delta. And uh, when he came back, he came into our, our dining room and we were all sitting around. We live, as you can imagine, and it was a nice, nice house, a nice dining room with crystal chandelier and the linen tablecloths and the uh, everything laid out beautifully. And he walked in, he said, I've just been to Mississippi. I've seen a family live in a, in a shack the size of our dining room. I've seen children with their stomachs distended with boils all over them because they don't have enough food and they're, not, they're malnutritious. malnutritious. Do you know how lucky you are? Do you know how lucky you are? You've got to give something back to this country. And we were also quoted St. Luke from the, those who have been given much, much will be expected. So I'd always learned um, the importance of giving back. But how you do it, I tribute to the women's movement who said a woman could go to law school, and I did go to law school. The women's movement wasn't able immediately to change law firms, however. I remember when I, um, I clerked for a federal judge, in fact, another one of my co-clerks is here today, uh, Betsy Strong. Um, and I applied for a 
law for you. You asked us to tell the bad and the good, so now you get two bad stories. So I, you know, I went to my interview and I said, you know, can I hear? Will I be able to do depositions and interrogatories? How often would I get into court? But I also asked, what would happen if my child got sick? What would happen if I had another child? And um, as my co-clerk got the job and I didn't, uh, he said to me, he had asked the one woman partner in the firm why he didn't, she, and he, she said, because she cares about her children. So then I thought, well, I'll try legal services. They take care of people who are in need. Maybe I should, you know, maybe they would allow me to work part-time. So I went to legal services and I asked the same kind of questions. But I didn't get very far because the head of legal services said, uh, you know what, we just want to be like the big law firms. We want to show that we're just as good as they are, and they don't allow part-time, we're not going to allow part-time. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell one bad story after the other. I will tell you what happened was that five years later, he ran for Congress, this head of the legal services, and he won, and he became head of the Family Friendly Caucus. <laughs> so every time he saw me, he'd walk down the other side of the street. <laughs> I could remind him of his past. But it did show that people can change, cultures can change. And I saw the same thing in politics in 1986 when I ran for Congress. I was constantly asked, how can you run? Uh, you have three children. How can you uh, leave them? What's going on? Don't you think your most important responsibility is to your kids? And I said, yeah, I mean, you never said that to my father when he had 10 killed children. <laughs> but nonetheless, the questions persisted. In 1990, Two, there were about two women lieutenant governors in the country. And by 1994, uh, in that election year, 21 women were elected. It just switched. And it says to me, culture and friendship and working together makes a difference. You can shift what people expect. You can shift what people think is the right thing to do. And I saw that as lieutenant governor as well. Um, I do care very deeply about women, family, and children's issues. But as the first woman lieutenant governor, I thought it was important that I took on what are traditionally male issues. So I became an, uh, was put in charge of all our anti-crime efforts, the Department of Corrections, the state police, juvenile justice, parole and probation, as well as economic development. Um, because I thought it was important to show that women could do anything. But I made sure that in those positions, I take a woman's, ask, I look at the woman's view on some of those questions. So I spent a great deal of energy on domestic violence. And again, it came back to me, yes, we change laws to toughen the penalties. Yes, we change laws about who could testify and when they could, could bring the cases of domestic violence. Yes, we put extra money and funding into training the 911 operators and the police and the state's attorneys and the judges. We did all of that. But then I'm confronted with a teacher when I'm doing these hearings around the state and she describes how in her sixth grade class, one of her 12-year-old students comes in beaten one day and she says to the, she assumes that she's beaten by the father or the mother's boyfriend or an uncle, as I'm sure you know those situations. And so she asks the little girl, what happened? What, what, what occurred? And the little girl said, oh, well, my boyfriend beat me. And the teacher said, well, I think you should uh, get rid of that boyfriend. And the little girl replied, I'd rather have a boyfriend who beats me than no boyfriend at all. So part of what we have to do, of course, is to change the culture. Because after all that training that we did, we still would have juries come back and not convict. And it comes from an old tradition that we have to change. And so as Lieutenant Governor, I made sure that every single state employee, over 80,000 state employees, got four hours training on domestic violence. So that it was changing the culture about what you should do. And, and part of that was to not stay silent when you saw somebody come in with a turtleneck on in the middle of summer, or somebody wearing really dark stockings 
when they don't usually do that. Because part of our tradition has to be, your life isn't so private. If you're being beaten, it's my business. And we wanted to change the culture. The same th similar uh, thing happened when I, as the first woman lieutenant governor, I thought that we should deal with the issue, as you've talked about today, juggling work and family. And I had a conference on juggling work and family. And what I saw in that conference, that yes, we have challenges with raising children, um, how to do that. But the biggest challenge I heard over and over again was how to take care of our elderly parents. And what came out of that was an idea that each of us has understood that family and work balance really is a public issue. And I think, thank you for the work that you've done on that. But at that point, this was about eight years ago, the idea of taking care of your parents was still seen as a private issue. We talked about it alone. We tried to deal with this issue alone. And yet when we could bring it out into the public, we realized that lots of people had that same challenge and that we had to come up with a political movement that said, how do we help mothers who are taking care of their kids and taking care of their parents or their aunts or their uncles or their mother-in-law, their father-in-law. And part of it really comes from understanding that many of the challenges is that we think that we're facing alone are faced by people just like us and we don't talk about it. And I hope that what the ABA does and continues to do is to encourage women to talk about what's going on, to get those friendships going, to get the political movement going. I know that in politics, Emily's List has been absolutely phenomenal in supporting women, in saying that what we do is critical. And on that note, one of my former colleagues as a lieutenant governor, Maisie Hirano, is here today. She was a former lieutenant governor. She's running for Congress. She was endorsed by Emily's List. And I hope any of you from Hawaii will vote for her. You got to support each other. Where is she? I said I'd help. I hope I do. I might get rid of the ABA's 501c3 <laughs> status. But really, that's critical to change the culture. My husband. Um, works uh, at St. John's College. He's a college professor, and he teaches the great books. And he teaches Aristotle. And the other night, he came home, and we were discussing Aristotle. I know you can't believe it, but it's true. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about what is the greatest virtue. And he said, OK, Kathleen, do you think the greatest virtue is justice or friendship? And of course, coming from the family that I come from, um, I'm a lawyer. I saw the value of the civil rights movement. I've seen the value of suing and making sure that you can deal with anti-discrimination laws and all sorts of issues, human rights issues around the world. I said justice. But I was pointed out to me that Aristotle thought that friendship was the most important. Because justice divides the goods once you have a city, but only friendship builds the city in the first place. And what I think this women's part of the ABA is doing is building the city. Aristotle defined friendship as men working with other men. I'd redefine it, men and women working together to build the good city. And what I think we need to do is help one another, support one another, be friends to one another to build the good city, the just city, and a better America. Good luck, and God bless you.